to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and this is the 2021 Job Market series where I speak with young scholars entering the academic job market about their latest research on India. I spoke with Karan Bappar, a PhD candidate in economics at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He also has a bachelor's in technology from Maharishi Dayanand University. We talked about his job market paper titled COVID-19 and period products usage among menstruating women in urban and rural India. We talked about women's access to healthcare, in particular sanitary products, especially during the COVID lockdown. We also talked about access to knowledge such as ovulatory cycle knowledge and its impact on unplanned pregnancies and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi Karan, welcome to the show. Hi Shruti, thank you for having me here. I'm super pumped up to talk about my research to a wider audience and yeah, can't wait to get started about it. So you basically work on women's health specifically gender related consumption and healthcare and hygiene consumption and also lgbtq issues can you give us the basic landscape of women's access to healthcare and sanitation products in india because we do understand that it's limited but i don't think we understand the magnitude of the problem right thank you professor so nfhs the core data has shown that you know sanitary item usage so they look at commercial products menstrual cups are something that has not been included as part of that so we have local and commercial sanitary napkins and tampons and around 57% of the women use sanitary items in rural and urban areas it's around 49% in the rural areas and 76% in the urban areas there are many state level variations so for example it's as low as 12% in bihar to as high as 91% in chandigarh or 97% in lakshadweep and 89% in kerala another important aspect that i looked at is ovulatory cycle knowledge so ovulatory cycle knowledge is the information around the pregnancy so nfhs four data has shown that around 17% women are aware of ovulatory cycle knowledge in india that's that's a really really low number so these numbers are around 16% in rural areas and around 19% in urban areas so now again the state level variations are like really different so it's as low as 8% in andhra pradesh to as high as 61 and 66% in punjab and chandigarh so other than punjab and chandigarh the second highest state would be kerala which stands at 36% so there's a lot of state level variations which clearly shows that ock is definitely one of the most taboo topic in india when we talk about sexual and reproductive health Thank you for that. So, you know, I want to dive straight into your paper which is specifically talking about sanitary hygiene and menstrual products and you know, access in particular during the COVID lockdown of 2020 and 2021, right? And in this sense, the pandemic has these additional unintended consequences through the lockdowns in that they exacerbate gender inequality. in particular health and hygiene and you know that has both short term and long term effects right so can you tell us exactly the nature of the problem that has been exacerbated because of these lockdowns sure so before starting with this i would like to also talk about why we really did this research so the pandemic and the lockdown had severely impacted period products and there were many commentary pieces many small surveys which were clubbed with topics on health and then there were reports which were based on very small numbers came out however these used to give us like valuable insights but these were like extremely small and we needed something that can provide us a nation wide picture when we talk about period product crisis so now when you uh, look into the literature there's a lot of work around school girls however the unschooled or the non school girls and when men who are greater than 18 years old these were never the focus uh, of the researchers so our paper also focuses on girls aged 10 to age 55 so we have a larger compensation in terms of you know the girls whom we are using in our study so our paper uses a combination of temporal and spatial variation by temporal variation i mean lockdown versus pre lockdown and by spatial variation i mean that there was a government mandated classification of districts into red orange and green zones so this helped us in exploiting the lockdown as a national experiment in 510 districts of india so in terms of zones we have data for ministry home of ministry of home appears 2020 red green and orange districts 
and data on period products were taken from CMI. So now we have seen two things. Firstly, we have seen the period product consumption, and then we have also seen the total product consumption. And both these consumption uh, things were, you know, taken care of uh, since we have used RBI estimates of inflation. So all the expenditure numbers were then appropriate using the RBI estimates of inflation. So in terms of results, what we have found that period products reduced by almost four times in red zones as compared to green zones, whereas it has reduced almost two times in orange zones as compared to red zones. So this is broadly what we found. And then going forward in terms of implications, one big alternate that can be used is to improve the existing distribution system. So right now we have ASA workers and we have you know local shopkeepers who would be selling the sanitary napkins. However, with the lockdown, Firstly, sanitary items never made it to the essentials list in the first go, which created a lot of delay. And obviously there was little dip in terms of sanitary items. Hence, it's very important that the existing distribution mechanism needs to be you know, enhanced. We need divisional administrators or district administrators who need to gather and release the period products. They can tie up with ASHA workers or other frontline health workers, local NGOs, SHGs, and they can distribute the patch bin, which can further be distributed to the other people in the communities, especially during the emergencies, because sanitary items are a very important part of women's health, and that needs to be taken care of as important as we are taking care of the other essential items. One of the interesting things that I'm learning from this is that sanitary products were not even included in the essential list items, right? So they were not included in the first go. So one week later, they were added into the sanitary items list. So there was a lot of backlash that they got from women and the other local NGOs and it created a stir and they were finally added after a week. But then that little delay of the week has definitely created a larger delay in terms of, you know, production of sanitary items because now everyone is allowed only at 50% consumption, right? So let's say when if there were like 10 people initially who were making sanitary pads in terms of production, now only five can make. So there was initial delay and then there was another production delay. So all these things created a lot of delay. But it's so interesting that it seems like it is men making policies for men. And there seems to be just a conversation missing about what is an essential household item. And this is particularly so in India, where India is just such a young country, right? So one would imagine that you would expect most women to be in the reproductive age and requiring these products, right? So it's kind of astounding to me that we have sort of just completely forgotten about hundreds of millions of women, right? This is not a this is not a small group that we're talking about. So from your paper, that was the part that sort of struck me the most. So I have a couple of follow up questions on, you know, sanitary products in particular. So overall, we know that consumption dipped during the lockdown. This is not just true for sanitary products, right? It's true for across the board. And we know that it also bounced back for the most part as the lockdown started easing right? How were sanitary products worse affected than regular consumption because of the lockdown? So actually, this is a very interesting question. So what we did, we checked the data on gloves, syringes, ORS, and other antibodies. There was small decrease in April and May, but there was a colossal dip when we talk about sanitary pads. That clearly shows that these items which are transferred through various distribution channels, so definitely there is some kind of distribution mechanism that is being maintained. However, maybe sanitary pads were not on the priority list by the government and other, you know, uh, policy makers. And that was the reason why we found that there was a lot of product dip around. Could there be a demand side dip in the sense that I know that sanitary pad usage is pretty low in India overall, right? Women use a lot of substitutes like rags and, you know, other kinds of home made products. Could it be that because they're not going out to work? And they don't need to be out and about, so to speak, right? They are substituting away from these slightly expensive products more for home use products, given that they are confined. Actually, this could be like a good good question, good argument. But remember, we are using difference and difference. So these are the same women who are using sanitary products before the lockdown and the same women who are using sanitary products after the lockdown. But they shouldn't, right? Because during the lockdown, you're not leaving the house. Right. So if there is a time to substitute away from these goods, then maybe that's the time to do it? 
So another thing I don't mean they're substituting yeah. away from them overall I mean just during the lockdown Definitely you know does consumption reduce for instance sure. like you know people bought less footwear because they're not leaving the house very right. much right. or you know right. people bought fewer clothes because they're not leaving the house they're kind of sitting in their yoga pants right this is the very western world like you know people have been talking about how formal clothing consumption has dipped could there be a similar demand side effect only during the lockdown for sanitary products which is not a supply explanation i guess that's my question sure so actually again this is very interesting because i also conducted a small survey to understand the menstrual health of the women during the lockdown so in my survey i couldn't find any such thing so definitely there was one thing that i appreciated a lot of women a small percentage of women moved to using menstrual cups since they wanted a place where you know since you are at home and you are at you know your relaxing position so if you're trying a new product you are comfortable in your own zone so that happened definitely but at, it was a very very small dip and that dip can't account for the four or four and a half times of you know items that we have seen and secondly i agree that you know the growth might be a little low since everyone was at home but the essential products were being delivered by amazon and flipkart and many other you know companies so that was always there so that was something that people have used at it i mean obviously i haven't talked about it in this paper because this is completely different from what i have done in the research but these were few of the examples that i have seen and i'm also going to talk about black marketing that i also see as one of the responses so there were a lot of women who have reported black marketing of period products women have told that they went to the shopkeeper to buy the sanitary items and then they were like so let's say if item is for 70 rupees they had to pay 350 bucks for that Uh, just because they are saying that this is a essential product and if i can quote the exact thing so they said in hindi that madam ye to zarurat ki cheez hai aapko isko bhi use karna hai aur lockdown mein kuch bhi nahi ban raha hai so this is very important and this is very essential so for the listeners who don't understand hindi what i have said is that during the lockdown we don't have the sanitary products production going on and that's the reason why everything is being costly and this is a essential item so you should buy it buy it at this amount yeah demand is incredibly inelastic at that point right when you need a pad you absolutely need a pad so you yeah. end up paying you know 350 rupees for it if that's what the requirement is when when there's a shortage when we th- think about sanitary products and this kind of shock right this lockdown or pandemic related shock it's a very short run issue and it bounces back relatively quickly are there any long run implications yeah there are few so again if you talk to doctors during the same time there was a dramatic increase in reproductive and urinary tract infections so infections increased to a multifold reason second there was this black marketing i'm not talking only in terms of women's health but what were the larger level issues another thing that came out from my survey was that around 22% of the women have missed their periods 15% have got two periods within the same month approximately 75% women have reported changes in menstrual pain and blood flow and 60% have reported change in the menstrual cycle so these are very long term implications that we are talking about and definitely it had it had a big impact if you don't mind i want to also you know discuss another one of your very interesting papers which is now about access to knowledge right more than just access to goods and services and this is about information on ovulation cycles right i haven't thought about this too much because you know as you can imagine i had a very privileged education you know i have learned all this in schools and at home so to me the idea that women might be lacking knowledge in you know correct ovulation cycles and therefore it leads to more unplanned pregnancies is surprising but as you lay it out it is a more common phenomenon in india than one would imagine and it has some really serious long term implications so can you just tell us a little bit about what is happening with information and education of women you know about their personal health and reproductive health in particular ovulation cycles sure So around 85 million women worldwide face unplanned pregnancy and 15% of these cases are in India. So since you talked about a lot about school education so definitely school education has been designed to talk about you know ovulation cycles however these sexual and reproductive health sessions are overly reliant and they broadly talk about the science concepts but they do not talk about the practical guidance. So due to the lack of this formal education most of the women or most of the girls get their ovulatory cycle knowledge basically from their mothers or from other elderly figures in the home and the state 
So now, if we talk in terms of research, so most of the researchers worldwide had focused on understanding the link between unplanned pregnancies and uses of contraceptives. They have also talked about unplanned pregnancies and socioeconomic factors. One of the critical factors that they really need to talk about is knowledge of population. But to the best of my abilities, I couldn't find more than one or two papers which are talking about it that to none in the Asian context. And they were broadly talking about the determinants of OCK and the research ended there. Even in schools, when we talk about teachers either skip this topic or it is something that is really talked about. And hence, it was very important that we start talking about ovulatory cycle knowledge and how it links to the other fertility outcome. So as a part of the study, we have made two broad contributions. Firstly, we have tried to see the prevalence and correlates of OCK. So OCK is very much endogenous for fertility outcomes. Since we discussed about that ovulatory cycle knowledge is definitely linked to my education level. So in case if I'm well educated, I would have a good ovulatory cycle knowledge. And hence, my age at first birth and my number of children would be less and my age at first birth would be a little higher. So that's why what we have done, we have used the intergenerational knowledge transfer from elder women and from mothers as an IV to measure the ovulatory cycle outcomes. So our instrument works since the knowledge held by older women in the district cannot directly impact the fertility decision of the women, except they can have an impact on their ovulatory cycle knowledge. And hence, we feel that our instrument work very well. So can you tell me a little bit about this transmission mechanism? So to me, it seems like you're saying that because they don't have like good science and, you know, schooling, which actually describes the process in detail, a lot of how they learn this is through their informal networks, women, their friends, you know, elderly women, maybe, you know, the midwives, the Anganwadis who are in, in a particular community and so on and so forth, right? That's the information transmission mechanism that is taking place, Right. Could it be that some of this informal knowledge transmission is now being substituted away because people are relying more and more on contraception to prevent unplanned pregnancies? And because of this, you know, this overall culture of intergenerational transfer of knowledge or women talking about these, you know, ideas has overall reduced because now there are alternatives to it in the form of condoms and birth control and so on. That's a very interesting thing. But at the same time, we also need to understand that India, it's such a taboo that I don't see girls or women walking in the top and asking for condoms or asking for contraceptives. They would need someone else for that. So I don't think so. It would be working that way in India as of now, just because, you know, it's such a big taboo topic. And in case if we can focus on ovulatory cycle or if we can focus on ovulation, it would work very well. So in terms of results, first we talked about the determinants of ovulatory cycle knowledge. So we found area of living in terms of rural or urban area, age groups, religion, caste, education level, wealth index, and mass media as the important factors which determine the ovulatory cycle knowledge. Then we also check for the intergenerational transfer of ovulatory cycle knowledge. In, when we talk about the other social demographic correlates, let's say area of living, age groups, etc. When we talk about these things, the odds ratio lies somewhere between zero to two. When I talked about intergenerational transfer of ovulatory cycle knowledge, it was almost 143 times impact on the final ovulatory cycle knowledge that we had. So that had a big, big impact. So that really cleared out that uh, the IV variable was like a really good one. And then we controlled for endogeneity by using the intergenerational transfer as an IV. And we found that OCK increases age at first birth and reduces the number of children. So that was something that we found in our study. Yeah, that makes sense, right? That people get to know their ovulatory cycles better and then they're able to better plan, you know, their sexual decisions and their pregnancies and so on. Karan, what else are you working on right now? So I conducted another survey during the pandemic to understand how homophobic bullying and gender-based bullying is creating issues for the mental health of those coming from the LGBTQIA community. So that is another thing that we are working on. So broadly, we have worked on two papers right now. So in the first paper, we are talking about the coming out stories of the LGBTQIA community to the parents and family. It's a qualitative study and it's a work in progress paper. And in the other paper, we are trying to understand how homophobic bullying affects depression. So we have developed a moderated mediation model where we show that gender-based bullying mediates the link between homophobic bullying and depression. And again, the link between gender-based bullying and depression is moderated by the self-concept. So people who have higher levels of self-concept and who are being gender-based bully will be more likely to be in a depressed state once we got the results. So this is broadly what we have found out right now. And 
Yeah, that's about it. Is this specific to the pandemic or is this the lockdown? Did that exacerbate these problems the way you find with women's, you know, uh, menstrual products and access? Or was it just the convenient time for you to do the survey? So actually, we conducted the survey sometime in October. So it was not exactly in the lockdown. And I don't think so that lockdown has exacerbated these situations. But these might be very underrepresented situations right now. Just because since the pandemic is there and most of the people are doing work from home, so a lot of bullying comes not from the people who are at home, but from people who are outside. And now since everyone is inside, so these might be underreported results, but again, one of the very important researches that needs to be done in India. Yeah, it's interesting. On the one hand, the pandemic and work from home situations and just decrease in economic and outside activity can reduce the kind of bullying one might face. Yeah. But on the other hand, it might also closet more people, right? Because a very large part of the problem in the LGBTQ community in India is coming out to families themselves right and so being at home so so it's sort of like this trade off between one kind of mental health problem versus another kind of mental health problem so i i know that you're absolutely right there's an incredibly underrepresented topic in india and and the numbers are so large in india that you know it's worth studying the community stand alone right as a question of mental health on a happier note what have you been up to during the pandemic okay so i started writing last year during the pandemic and I have written various media articles. That is one thing what I've started doing because there are a lot of issues that I actually think about that I should be talking about, I would say. And after that, any topic that I felt about that, you know, it should be it should be up there in the market or I should have an opinion about it, I have talked about it. Recently, there was a ban, there was a TikTok ban in India last year in May, right? So everyone was saying, why is it good? They have done like really good by banning the TikTok. But we were coming from the other side and we said that, you know, TikTok actually created a good market for a lot of people. So, for example, someone who's coming from a rural area, he has extre- he's extremely talented, but she's extremely talented. So TikTok provided them a platform where they can show their talent and they can you know, reach out to a wider audience. So it is like killing the voices of those people that has been really wrong. So that is one thing that I have done. And then last year, there was this national education policy that came out. So I was actually hoping that national education policy is coming out after like almost 28 years. And, you know, we would be getting something, something really great. But when national policy came out, we realized that, you know, there was no mention about menstruation, which is one of the very important topics. So at one end, policy was saying that girls are an underrepresented group. We need to do things where we can bring girls back to school. And at the same time, there was no talk about menstruation. So around almost miss around 23% uh, of the school time just because of menstruation. And hence, it's one of the very, very big topics that needs to be really talked about. And it was missing out from national education policy. So that was again another thing that we talked about that why it's really, really important that, you know, we need to come together as a society and really talk about menstruation. Lastly, I'm also vocalizing for, you know, men to talk about sexual and reproductive health, especially menstruation and ovulation. So if you'll see, there's not a lot of work around sexual and reproductive health. It's because we as men don't talk about it. And any topic that men talk about gets the dominant discourse in the society. And just for this broader domain to be coming out, we really need to talk about menstruation. And lastly, there is no discourse of LGBTQIA in the discourse around menstruation. So when we talk about menstruation, it's just about, you know, women. There's nothing about the LGBTQIA community. We really need to include trans and non-binary in the discourse of inspiration. Absolutely. So these were some of the things that I really felt that, you know, we should be talking about. And I wrote a lot of amazing pieces around these articles. I'm really looking forward to reading that. I've only read your research so far. So I'll definitely look up uh, some of the popular pieces and we'll link to them. Finally, the most important question during the pandemic, what have you been binge watching? I guess I have watched a lot of web shows in... I've watched a lot of web series, a lot of movies. I'm like a movie buff. So before PhD, I used to watch movie almost every Friday. But then PhD happened and then pandemic happened. So I have recently started watching movies. It was required for me to, you know, start living again. So that has really helped me. Do you have any recommendations? So I guess I have talked a lot about, you know, sex education. So I would recommend everyone to watch sex education. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah that's i think a great recommendation it 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 marries your uh, personal interests and your research interest really well thank you so much for doing this karan it was a pleasure to speak with you same here swati it was really nice and i look forward to talking with you again thanks for listening to ideas of india If you enjoy this podcast please help us grow by sharing with like-minded friends. You can connect with me on Twitter at srajagopal. In the coming weeks we will feature weekly short episodes with young scholars entering the academic job market discussing the latest research on India. Also check out our new initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com. The 1991 project is an effort to revive the discourse on growth-centered economic reforms in India by focusing on the economic ideas that drove them. In the coming months, we will publish essays, data visualizations, oral histories, podcasts, and policy papers demystifying the Indian economy and the 91 reforms. You can see all the content and subscribe to our newsletter for updates at the 1991project.com.